When you hear about two drivers being killed in one season with a third driver being quite badly injured, you're probably going to assume that the season being discussed is 1994, when Rubens Barrichello was quite badly injured during the San Marino Grand Prix practice session, and then obviously the deaths of Ratzenberger and Senna through qualifying and into the race. But there was another season where this thing happened, and that season is 1982, when Jules Villeneuve was killed at the ultra-fast Zolder circuit in Belgium, and with his death the sport lost one of its best up-and-coming talents, and you know, some would say that he was the most naturally quick driver of them all. And this whole thing started supposedly because of a spat he had with his teammate at the previous race. So then 1982, turbos, ground effect, and Enzo Ferrari had two drivers who were certain to bring the Constructors and Drivers Championships back to Maranello. In one car, you had Didier Peroni, and in the other car was French-Canadian sensation Gilles Villeneuve. But while both drivers were certainly talented, Peroni and Villeneuve couldn't have been any more different. They were Prost and Senna before Prost and Senna. Now Villeneuve was like Senna, he'd take the risks a lot of other drivers wouldn't dream of taking. He'd lob it in and risk crashing for a position while Peroni would do the bare minimum to get the maximum. So if second was out of reach, Peroni would just settle for third and then pick up positions through people's misfortunes and mistakes along the way instead of being balls to the wall. So if anything, Villeneuve was like how people think racing actually is, while Peroni was like how racing actually is, if that makes sense. And they both had a car that would win them races, if not the entire championship. The Ferrari 126C2 was a noticeable improvement over the 1981 car in that it actually worked, and the other teams knew that this car in the hands of either Peroni or Villeneuve would be taking the driver's title, and the constructor's title would undoubtedly be going as well to Italy. But there was another battle going on, a political one in offices all around the world, because everybody's favourite FIA president Jean-Marie Balestri had brought in a ridiculous ruling regarding super licence. Basically, you couldn't switch teams until your contract with that team expired, so if you were contracted to Williams, you were not allowed to move until your contract with Williams expired. Now this angered a lot of the drivers and caused a full-on strike in South Africa, one of the many battles of the Fisa Foca war that I have done before but will most certainly need to revisit. And most of the privateer teams boycotted the 1982 San Marino Grand Prix after Brabham and Williams had one car each disqualified from the results in Brazil, and Villeneuve was disqualified from the Long Beach race due to an illegal rear wing. And all these no-shows meant that only 14 cars started that race at Imola. The manufacturer teams like Renault and Ferrari and Alfa turned up, and some of the privateers turned up due to sponsor obligations or just being Italian registered. But, you know, like I say, the whole war as a whole is something I need to revisit again. And since the Imola circuit is the closest to Maranello, the crowds turned up in droves just to see Enzo's red cars and the French-Canadian wizard that drove it. Given how good that Ferrari was supposed to be, the crowds were expecting a victory, or at the very least, a great result. And they'd get one, but they'd also see the beginning of the end. The Renaults were superb in qualifying at this time, but they tended not to be too good in the race. They usually just blew up. The two Renaults of Arnoux and Prost were 1 and 2 on the grid with the two Ferraris in behind, Arnoux being 0.4 of a second ahead of Alain and had nearly a full second in hand over Villeneuve. But on lap 6, after getting to the front, Prost's engine went pop and that gave Arnoux the lead. While Arnoux had a gap, Peroni and Villeneuve started racing each other hard and despite the battling, they caught up to Arnoux and it was a three-way scrap for the lead. But on lap 44, the Ferraris became hashtag blessed because Arnoux's turbo went pop and that gave the Ferraris the lead, with Villeneuve leading from Peroni, and that in turn sent the crowds absolutely wild. Villeneuve was ahead of his teammate, and given how bad the opening rounds had been for Ferrari, particularly Villeneuve, as he was on zero points going into this round, it meant that because Brabham, Williams, McLaren, Lotus hadn't turned up, it meant that Ferrari was going to gain significant ground in the Constructors' Championship, and Peroni and Villeneuve were going to gain considerable ground in the Drivers' Championship. But Peroni wasn't done. He wanted the win, so he overtook Villeneuve. So Villeneuve took him back. Then Peroni got Villeneuve and the Villeneuve retook the lead. Uno reverse cards being lobbed around left, right and centre. Ferrari could see this too, and the team, if not the man himself, given that Imola was one of the few races he actually attended, basically went, nah, they're going to kill each other, and they couldn't risk the two drivers wiping out each other and losing the points that they desperately needed for the championship. So they basically just put all the meme radio conversations in terms of team orders into one long sentence. Valtteri, it's James, it's getting silly now, 
you must not overtake Damon. They held out a pit board that said, quite simply, slow. And I think there may have been a miscommunication as to what that actually meant, or one of the two drivers decided it meant something else. Villeneuve took it as hold position, multi-21 if you will. Peroni saw it as keep racing, but don't smash up the cars. So at the toes of hairpin on the final lap, Peroni sent it up the inside and took the lead. Villeneuve's face afterwards was the same colour as his car, and there is a famous picture of him on the podium just leaning on the railings, looking really glum, and Jackie Stewart is standing next to him with a bottle of champagne. I'd put it into the video, but there are rules, but I'm sure you can find it. I have to use Creative Commons stuff, we've been over this a million times. So Villeneuve claimed, you get a slow sign and that means whole position. This has been the case ever since I joined Ferrari. While Peroni claimed, slow means to be careful not to crash. There are no restrictions on overtaking. And the Villeneuve said, I have declared war. I will do my own thing in future. So then things move on to Zolder, the home of the Belgian Grand Prix. At least it was at that time. Well, between 1975 and 1982, it was the home of the Belgian Grand Prix. And a fun fact, Zolder is one of three tracks to host the Belgian Grand Prix, the other two being Spa, obviously, and the little-known Nivelle circuit, which was used in 1972 and 1974. Now, like Spa, Zolder was fast, scenic, and dangerous, and chicanes had been put in on the back straight and before the pit straight to try and slow the cars down. And in qualifying, the Renaults were once again on pace and first and second on the grid. This time, Prost ahead of Arnoux. The Ferraris, meanwhile, were sixth and eighth, with Villeneuve only a tenth of his teammate. With less than ten minutes remaining on the clock, Villeneuve was coming over the crest at the hill at turn eight, which is a turn called Boot Corner on the track map, and I hope I've pronounced that right, which then leads down the hill towards turn nine, which is called... Tullemanbocht. Again, I apologise. As Villeneuve came through turn 8, he saw Joachim Mass's march in front of him, and it's thought that Mass assumed Villeneuve was on a flyer given how fast he was approaching. So Mass did the sensible thing and moved to the right so the Ferrari could pass on the racing line. But as Mass moved, so did Villeneuve, and the closing speed meant that Villeneuve couldn't react in time to move in the other direction, and the two cars hit each other. It's thought that Villeneuve hit Mass at around 140 miles an hour or so. Villeneuve was in the air for the next 100 metres and then some, before hitting the ground nose first that caused the Ferrari to disintegrate as it made contact with the tarmac. Now shockingly, Villeneuve's seat became separated from the chassis, and the seat, with Villeneuve still in it, carried on for another 50 metres or so before seat and driver ended up in the catch fencing on the exit of turn 9. John Watson and Derek Warwick were the first two drivers on the scene, besides Joachim Mass that is, and they found Villeneuve in the catch fencing, and through Villeneuve's helmet they could see that he was blue in the face. A doctor had arrived within 45 seconds and found the Canadian not breathing, and he was put in a helicopter on life support and taken to San Rafael Hospital to be tended to. But Villeneuve had suffered a fatal neck fracture, and at 9.12pm that evening with his wife by his side, they switched off the life support and he was pronounced dead. There are conflicting reports as to what happened that afternoon. Many think Villeneuve was driving as fast as humanly possible to find that extra tenth to beat Peroni, but Mara Forgieri, Villeneuve's race engineer, said that he was on his in-lap but was driving at his usual brisk pace. Which leads some people to claim that Villeneuve was trying to get back to the pits as fast as possible to maximise his qualifying attempts. It does seem like a lot of effort to risk everything for a tenth of a second, but you know, that's how some racing drivers are wired. But given Alan Prost's recollection of the events, the whole I was betrayed by Didier so fuck him approach might have been a contributing factor after all. Prost said, the week before he died, Gilles called me several times and all the time he was talking about Peroni. He was so angry, I couldn't believe it. When the accident happened, I knew exactly why. And because Villeneuve only had two speeds, warp 9 and stop, he may have taken it too far just that once, and as we've seen a million times before in racing, once is all it takes. I mean, looking at it, it could just be seen as a miscommunication between Mass and Villeneuve. Mass wasn't expecting Villeneuve to approach that quickly, Mass moved, Villeneuve went the same way, they crashed, it happens, it was a freak accident, and that's how Villeneuve died. But that wasn't going to be the end of it for 1982. 
At the Canadian Grand Prix, a race already being run under a huge black cloud, Peroni stalled his car at the start and was hit by Riccardo Paletti, resulting in Paletti's death at the circuit named in Gilles' honour. Then at the German Grand Prix, Peroni made an uncharacteristic error. Now, according to articles that I've read to put this whole thing together, Peroni had become detached and was a completely different person, almost like he'd completely lost the plot. And going into the German Grand Prix, he was actually leading the championship. Basically, what had happened was Peroni had set his time. He was on pole, but then the heavens opened and it started raining. But then Peroni decided he was going to go out again. He was going like a bat out of hell on a wet track where it was his turn to hit a car unsighted from behind. This time, it was Alain Prost Renault. The way the accident panned out was scary like his teammates, but unlike Villeneuve, Peroni would survive. He'd never race in F1 again because his legs had been totally smashed in. But with Villeneuve and Peroni no longer racing, Renault couldn't capitalise on their qualifying pace and retired from too many races to make it count, with Arnoux somehow walking away from a smash at the Dutch Grand Prix. So the championship went to Keke Rosberg, a man who won just one race all season. Formula 1's hottest rivalry since Hunt and Lauda in 1976 burned out before it could get going, and Ferrari's wait for a driver's championship would go on until the next century. And ironically, it was against the Ferrari that Gilles' son Jacques won a Formula 1 World Championship, beating Michael Schumacher in controversial circumstances at the final race of the 1997 season, just two years after he won the Indy 500 and the kart title. We are approaching 40 years since that betrayal at Imola and the death of Gilles Villeneuve and speculation still runs riot as to what was going on between the two drivers and within Ferrari and all of that stuff and Gilles Villeneuve in death has been put on a very high pedestal along with drivers such as Jim Clark and Ayrton Senna and people like that. So then a look at the rivalry between Villeneuve and Peroni and how it might have caused the death of one of Formula 1's most naturally gifted drivers. If you have your own theories as to what happened on that fateful afternoon, then leave them in the comments section underneath this video and get a discussion going because I may have missed a, a few things or you just might have some thoughts and things like that. You know, leave them down there and get a discussion going as I said. And while scrolling down, why not trigger that algorithm by liking the video and if you're not already subscribed, do get subscribed and get that bell on so you never miss out on a future video. Massive thanks as ever go out to the legends of Patreon for their continued support and if you want to help support this channel at a more personal level you can do so by following the link in the description where there will also be links to Discord and also to my socials. So until next time, I've been Aidan Mord, have a great day wherever you live in the world and I'll see you all again soon for another video. So until next time, goodbye.